as I was about to continue along on this little journey, um, my phone switched off and it kind of like was pulling up a web page and that was the web page of the um, new national security director. I think her last name, okay, I don't know, I don't want to get it wrong. Anyway, she was just sworn in today. She was the deputy director of the CIA under Obama. She is linked to Johns Hopkins, which um, has come up for me in as being linked to, to crime. Um, specifically linked to maybe crimes that Obama's been involved in. And by crimes, I mean crimes against children, murders, and things like that. Um, I don't know what it specifically was going on with this kid in Tennessee, but something. Okay, so, well, so it's implants. It's, that's what it is. It's implants. So the implants are essentially murders because the implants are used to murder. Um, so she's linked to the Johns Hopkins University of Chicago. And so I know Chicago is a problem. I know Obama is a problem. I know Johns Hopkins is a problem. So what am I going to do? Oh, it looks to me like Biden's setting up a, his crime system, okay? I knew I knew Trump was a problem, okay? I, I'm not saying Trump wasn't a problem. And I'm not saying Trump didn't decide he was going to kill us. But Trump, at least people were trying to hold him accountable. And what I'm saying right now, I'm not out there to try to, you know, throw people in jail as if I could. What I'm saying right now is we need to end this problem. Like, not by assassinating your way through it, but by ending the crime. And also stopping, no longer protecting people who have... <laughs> I don't think people should be protected anymore. Like Obama. And I'm a Democrat. I voted for Obama twice. I voted for Biden. Who else was I going to vote for? I want more choices, though. I, I, I want to be able to vote for somebody who's not involved in this kind of thing. So that, okay, so that's a, a digression because, I mean, what the hell am I supposed to do? Stop? I can't stop. They'll kill me anyway. My My goal is not to get killed, but... Um, right now, it looks to me like Obama's, I mean, Obama, Biden's surround, getting the troops surrounded, right? He's, he's fortifying the fort. This should have ended ages ago. This should have ended in 2014. This should have never happened like this. And if the, you know, if the United States Department of Defense cared about me, they should have actually, you know, been with me when I made that first charge towards freedom. They should have been with me, and they should be with me now. I can't stop. I can't, I can't stop and sit here and get killed by these people. Okay, here's, here's what I'm, the, what I'm going to talk about now. This, um, you know, um, Adventist affidavit. Now, what's interesting about this, right? I talked about how this showed up in the PCC file. Um, <clears throat> that was vaguely interesting, not really, you know, any big rev revelations in that. But this, I had several copies of this, right? And, and I had several copies that included copies of what I was trying to describe here, right? Because I'm actually going through point by point in a medical report, addressing every point that I have an issue with. So it, wouldn't it be helpful to have the medical report with it? And I did. I had several copies of it, and they're all, they were all accompanied by the medical report. Guess what? There are no medical reports. I can't find, I've, I've found, I still can find several copies of this affidavit, or at least more than one. I can't find any of the medical report itself, but... I did find another thing in here, okay? This is a threat. Now I see what this is. This is a threat. Um, this was in 
this box out of place because I didn't put this in this box. There's a bunch of other stuff that was thrown out of the box and this is in the box. What is this? This was a severe attack to my heart. This was a terrifying attack to my heart. Terrifying. I called the ambulance. They wouldn't take me to Providence. They took me to Adventist. Okay, this is addressing in a, a situation in Adventist. And Adventist was, was not nice to me. They treated me like crap. They treated me like, you know, and I'm telling you, this was a severe attack. Um, to my heart, by an outside, it wasn't, it wasn't palpitations and it wasn't even really pain. I don't even know how to describe what it was. It was like my heart was being squeezed and forced to beat extremely fast at the same time. Okay, this is terrifying. This is what I thought I was going to get out of. I thought I was, I'd be set free, right? If I couldn't be set free under the conditions of what happened over the past couple months, I've got a serious freaking problem here. I mean, serious. I can't sit back and wait for this to happen again. And the thing that precipitated this it wouldn't have been something that I would have expected would precipitate something like this as far as, you know, this is a retaliation thing that was going on. Um, it was me talking about Humboldt State being involved in something. And I don't remember what it was. It was something linked to implants. Maybe something linked to Brett Bowman, but I'm not sure. It didn't seem to me like it was any big reveal. But... All of a sudden, it was just like my heart started going, <laughs> getting pushed harder and harder and harder to the point where I was like, oh my God. So that's what this is. This is a threat from Adventist, probably, on behalf of Adventist. So I'm guessing that this, you know, I'm guessing that this stuff has been done by this woman upstairs and that she's working on behalf of the crime network, which is linked to the FBI and to all these hospitals. So they're all working together. Your workup today was reassuring there are no immediate life-threatening causes of your symptoms. So it's it's just a threat. That's what it is. Right? So without having the benefit of the actual paper itself, should I go through this? Maybe. So I explain who I am. I explain who my daughter is. I explain some background. Um, on January 20th, 2014, I discovered evidence that the webcam on my desktop computer had been hijacked. Um, so this is, you know, beyond hacked. It's, I mean, I don't know, it's, you could say hacked, but it's basically somebody has taken it over and is using it to film me and my daughter and Chris, but it was especially me and my daughter because this was up where we were and it was facing the bathroom door. Um, so they could film right into the bathroom. Now there was probably also cameras right in our bathroom. I, the, but um, I couldn't prove that, but I could show what was going on with my computer. The evidence included my observation that the webcam software, my Gmail account kept turning itself on by itself, indicated by the on off icon turning from red to green. Now this was a this was actually a reveal. I mean it doesn't necessarily matter. You know, I guess the intent. The thing about this was is that we'd been, you know, the camera had been hijacked long before I noticed the camera turning from red to green. Because what had happened was the interface had been manipulated in such a way that I didn't even see the icon most of the time. But what they wanted to do was reveal that they were doing this. And the reason why they wanted to reveal this is because they wanted me to freak out about it. Like any, I would think any healthy parent would do when they find out that this kind of thing is going on, you know, where, where their teenage daughter is potentially unclothed. Um, and call the police or whatever. And then the police would then take me to the doctor and the doctor would say she's crazy. And they would try to hold me for being crazy or a danger or whatever. They, they, may, they just make stuff up, right? 
It doesn't even matter what you say. Um, so that's why I noticed that part of it. That's why I noticed that they, they, I was supposed to notice because they wanted, they were getting beyond, um, we're just going to do surveillance because I could, I was, they knew that I was sensing something was going on. So they were going to get ahead of the ball on that and they were just going to like, um, gaslight me and then say I was crazy. So at the time, my computer was positioned so as to face the door of my office, which was located directly across the hall from my bathroom, a full view of my toilet, bathtub, and shower. Thus, anyone who could um, potentially see through the, my computer webcam could also see directly into the bathroom used by me and my teenage daughter. The realization came to me immediately and was extremely disturbing, as I think it would be to any parent of a young girl. And I maintain that. I maintain that that should be disturbing to any parent. Other types of... The fact that my parents weren't disturbed by this is disturbing. But my parents, I've had to give up on them. Acting like human beings. How I think human beings should act. Other types of evidence suggesting unwarranted surveillance in my home included activities from my private life being reflected back and mocked by other people, both friends and people who were unknown to me via social networking sites and publications such as Willamette Week. So in other words, this is part of the reveal, but um, because it was happening through publications, right, it's hard to, you know, say, oh, this picture is trying to illustrate something about me, you know, and they're like, oh, well, that, I, I could actually show that. There's ways that I can show that. But part of the trick here is they don't give me more than three minutes to make my case. You know, if, if, if I can't make my case in three minutes, they just say I'm paranoid and crazy. So once it had become clear that I experienced some kind of widespread invasive and illegal surveillance, I called the police, Portland Police Department in order to make a report. Because I, you know, because I'm a citizen who trust, trusted the police department to do their job and not to be doing crimes. It didn't even occur to me that the police department would be involved in this. How could that possibly be? My expectations were the police would make, take a report and make an, a sincere effort to investigate the matter. So like in my little Mayberry world that I was living in back then, I didn't necessarily expect the police to solve the crime but I expected them to get started on it. The police department said they would have to send an officer to my home in order for me to make a report. So, in other words, they wouldn't allow me to go to the police department to do it. But Chris said he didn't want the police to come to our home. So I arranged to meet the police at a nearby cafe with internet access, so I just brought my computer so I could show them, you know, some of the stuff that I had noticed. So I met the police officer at a cafe called Karma Cafe, which was located near 82nd Division. And I brought my desktop computer to the Karma Cafe and plugged it in. Two officers then arrived and met me, a man and a woman. The woman spent much of the time outside the cafe on her phone, so nearly all of my interaction was with the male officer who offered introduced himself as Officer DeLong. I asked Officer DeLong if he was related to a guitar player named Kirk DeLong, and he said that yes, Kirk DeLong is his uncle. Um, Officer DeLong's uncle, Kirk DeLong, was in a Portland band called The Makers. And then he was in another band called Family Gun. So both of those are mafia references. Okay, we're talking about a family with a musician and a police officer. The Makers was affiliated, I say, with an Olympia Washington label called Kill Rock Stars. And not, apparently Kill Rock Stars is a very literal name. This may or may not. Be a significant detail. It, it, it was a significant detail. In fact, it was significant also because of Toby Vale being involved at this point. Um, I explained to Officer DeLong 
Now, at the time, I was like, oh, well, isn't that interesting? You know, you have an uncle who's in, who does music like us. In fact, I even said to him, well, he, it's, I even said to him something about, you know, um, well, check with your uncle, you know, he'll know about something, something like, you know, innocent little me, you know, they must have just thought I was just the funniest thing ever, you know, being so innocent and naive. I explained to Officer DeLong what I had discovered about my computer webcam. He asked me what, who I thought res was responsible, and I named one or more specific individuals who I thought at the time may have been responsible. They happened to be individuals associated with Seattle and Olympia record labels, including Kill Rock Stars. Um, Officer DeLong then asked me to show him the evidence that I had found, but right as I was trying to show him how the webcam had been altered, he interrupted me and asked me to take a psychological assessment. He led me to believe that this was standard operating procedure for anyone reporting illicit surveillance. He told me that the assessment would only take about 15 minutes. You know, I really wish that the world existed as I thought it has existed at this time. Like, I would be so much happier. That's why I wonder if people, you know, all these people that think they're so, you know, that I'm so stupid and that, you know, this is the way it's supposed to be, that, you know, the police are doing surveillance on children and things like that and um, lying about people, you know, and locking people up for fake psychological diagnoses and things like that, that they think that this is just the way it should be. Like, just imagine if it, the world actually operated the way that they claim it operates. The police actually investigated crime and cared about protecting women and children. Just imagine. To my way of thinking, such an assessment would only confirm that I have no mental health problems and thus strengthen my case, so I had, I had no objection to it. I asked Officer DeLong if he would take a report from me when the assessment was complete, and he said that he would, so it seemed like no big deal to me. You know, it's just a hoop you have to jump through, right? Officer DeLong asked me to follow him in my car to Adventist Hospital on 60th Street in order to conduct the the assessment. I put my computer into the trunk of my car and followed him as directed. As we were leaving the cafe, Officer DeLong said something I found confusing at the time, but prescient in res retrospect. He said, they cannot hold you there involuntarily even if they wanted to. Like it didn't even occur to me in a million years that they would try to hold me involuntarily. And why? Because I know that in order to be held involuntary, on a, in a, to be kept on an involuntary hold, you have to be a danger to yourself or someone else. And I wasn't. I was just trying to report a crime. And so that was weird that he even said that. Like, I wouldn't, it didn't even cross my mind that they would do that. I understood we were going to Adventist Hospital for the assessment. I did not understand that, in fact, he was bringing me to an emergency room. Because that's different, right? If you're going to, if, if, if it's, I, I just thought, I don't know what I thought. I mean, I thought, okay, well, it just, I it never, it, first of all, I didn't even expect it. It took me off guard, right? Why would you, but it's just like, oh, well, this is just what we do. When we file, if we just take, take you to the doctor, they have to do a quick little five-minute assessment, and then we're good, and then we file the report. And I'm like, okay, you know, it's just, you know, crossing your T's and dotting your I's, you know. That's what I thought it was. But he's taking me to an emergency room. That's different. That suggests that he thought there was an emergency, which would be ridiculous. There was no, you know, but why would he think that? So that, that shows the power of being caught off guard on something like this, where... They're existing, it's like he was existing in a completely different reality than I was existing in. I was existing in a very straightforward world where, you know, things are up front. What you say is what you mean. What you mean is what you say. The laws are followed in spirit and letter. And officers actually have an interest in solving crime. That's the world I was existing in. I walked into the reception area with Officer DeLong. Immediately I filled out the initial, after I filled out the initial paperwork, the hospital staff brought me to a windowless room with a roll-down door. 
Officer DeLong then, then left, and I never saw him again. So it was like a trap, right? I mean, well, how else would you describe that? After several minutes, a doctor came into the room and asked me some very basic questions. The entire, the entire interview lasted about five minutes. To me, it seemed like a very routine interview, and it was clear I had no intention of bringing any harm to myself or anyone else, that I simply wanted to make a police report. The doctor left the room. Okay, and then they just left me there. And mind you, I have my daughter at home waiting for dinner. I have Chris. I, I'm thinking that I'm filing a police report. It's going to take 15 minutes to a half an hour tops. And then I'm going to go home, make my daughter dinner. It's a school night. It's Monday night, Martin Luther King Day. You know, that's what I was thinking. But now they left me alone in this room, windowless room. So then a nurse comes in and asks me for blood and urine. What the hell was that about, right? I refused. I said I couldn't see the point. I was like, if I'm going to give blood and urine, I want to do it to my own doctor. Not, not, not what the hell is even going on? And she hands me a hospital gown and asks me to put it on. And I said, no, my daughter's waiting at home. And it's getting late. It's almost 8 p.m. I had, didn't expect to be away this long. The doc nurse then told me the doctor had ordered an involuntary psychiatric hold. At that point, I began to panic because, like, what the hell is going on? right? And I, you know, then it becomes really clear, wait a minute, you're in this windowless room with a metal roll down door. They're telling you they're going to hold you there for no understandable, discernible reason. So I told him my daughter was at home and needed to be cared for. It was a school night. We hadn't eaten dinner. So I basically begged them to let me go. So the nurse leaves the room, returns and says the doctor had released the hold but that I should take anti-anxiety medication. So she gives me a uh, prescription for 7 at Ativan, or maybe she gave me the 7 Ativan. So I didn't feel I needed the medication, but I was glad to be released and um, left the hospital. So I'd been there around an hour and never spoke, never saw the police officer again. The thing about the Ativan, okay, immediately struck me as weird because... Um, well, first of all, I wasn't, I didn't have any issues with anxiety. Um, but I had in the past, okay, there was this whole thing with the past, right? Where it had panic attacks, which by the way, are not a mental health diagnosis, according to what I read in the DSM. But the thing about the panic attacks is that was all frequency-based weapons attack. So a panic attack is a physiological, a set of physiological symptoms where your heart's beating real fast, you know, your breathing becomes shallow, you get this fight or flight feeling. That can be created with frequency-based weapons, I now realize, and that's what was going on. Anyways, that had happened to me in the past, and I had taken Ativan, and I'd taken Ativan, and it continued to happen, and I continued to take Ativan, and so that when you do that, you get a physical dependence on a drug, and that had happened to me, and I had to wean myself off of Ativan, you know, and, you know, try to figure out how to manage, you know, these the symptoms of the panic attacks without these types of drugs. Um, so anybody that had access to my medical records would have known that Ativan had been in a drug that it's not that I was addicted to it. I was never addicted to it, but I did ha depend, develop a physical dependence on it. So why would they give it to me, especially when I didn't need it? And the reason is pretty obvious. The reason is that they wanted to, well, a couple things. One is Ativan, especially when you're not used to it, will wipe out your memory. And then the other is that they were hoping I was addicted to it and that they could re-trigger the addiction. So it was a hostile. It wasn't, they, it wasn't, they weren't trying to be helpful. They were trying to sabotage me. And, um, this isn't just, I'm not just saying Advanus was behind this. I'm saying, I think... It was, I think that there was another entity behind Adventus. In fact, I'm sure there was. And one of those entities, maybe multiple entities, one of the entities would have been my mom, I believe. So I went home to my family and cooked a very late dinner. So it was a very, it was almost like nothing was ever the same after this. So, um, 
you know, the following year, it took me a year to start collecting, really start collecting my medical records. Um, because I didn't realize until that point that there was a pattern of falsifications in them. So on March 1st, 2015, I requested a copy of the medical report taken that night. There are things in both the handwritten physician's report and the typed report which are inaccurate, misleading, or straightforward lies. And so that's the part that's missing, is the medical reports. The handwritten physician's notes are difficult to read, but I believe that under HPI it says paranoia. Several months, someone following her and putting it on the internet. The world she... The I, the word she is scribbled out. So the word the word she is scribbled out and, and is written, I expose their lies. They control the music industry. Under PE, it says polite rambling. And then something I can't read. Under diagnostic impressions, it says anxiety. And under discharge plan, it says Ativan is needed. And then under CC, it says paranoia voluntary. It's interesting it says voluntary because I don't know what CC stands for, but it's suggesting maybe that I I was asking them to hold me, which of course I wasn't. Um, so all of this was false. None of this happened. I didn't say anything about exposing any lies of the music industry. Um, but this... This phrase, they control the music industry, was something that I said at home privately. I may have written it in a letter that nobody, that was never given to anybody. Um, and what I think is that these handwritten notes were made after the fact. I think these handwritten notes were not made the day that I showed up at the doctor's office. I think they were made after I requested the notes. Um, they definitely were not. They definitely weren't made the day I was at the doctor's office, unless, unless okay. Now that I know what I know now, I know that when I write things down, some there seems to be a way that they're remotely read. I think both there's um, monitoring of my thoughts through these implants. And also, I have lots of implants in my hands, so there might be monitoring of my muscles as well. So when I write something down, even if nobody sees it, it can be seen. So that might have been what was going on. <laughs> Nonetheless, this was nothing that I said in the doctor's visit by any means. I'm, I'm not that dumb, okay? It was a simple interview. It was a five-minute interview. Do you feel depressed? No. Have you ever felt depressed? They may have asked me. I said, maybe maybe in junior high school I felt depressed. Um, do you have any intention of harming yourself or anyone else? No. No, no, no. I just want to make a police report. That's all. It's very, very basic. I knew not to give them a bunch of, you know, information. And certainly not a bunch of stuff like this. So, I... I, I'm speculating about where they got this information. It just wasn't anything that I said. So I say that they control the music industry was interesting since I, it was something that I said in private. I didn't say it to the doctor. Um... And I'm saying that the idea that I was paranoid and delusional is taken as a given, despite the fact that Officer DeLong made no effort whatsoever to assess, evaluate, or investigate evidence as to the veracity of my claim. And why didn't he make an effort to assess, evaluate, or investigate the evidence? Because he knew I was telling the truth. He knew I was telling the truth because it was the police who were doing this. Um, although my co conversation with Officer DeLong, I did name between one and four specific individuals who I thought might be motivated to commit this kind of crime, you know, or not just that they might be motivated, but there's other reasons why I thought they were involved based on their behaviors. Um, the medical report does not name of the, any of these individuals, and I didn't say anything about any of this to the doctor. This was only to Officer DeLong. 
Um, so it's this idea that the music industry is after me, right? It's, it's this vague boogeyman kind of thing. It's all made up. I didn't say any of that. Medical report says that the patient endorses feeling depressed. This is untrue. I was not depressed, and I didn't say that I was depressed. Um, yeah, I was upset about spying, right? I was being spied on. That was upsetting to me. But I was mostly just interested in getting through this medical exam so I could make a police report. So the following day, I called Officer DeLong and complained about the way he had treated me. He denied culpability, saying the doctor had decided to put me on an involuntary hold. So he was putting it off on the doctor. I don't, I don't know who it was, but it doesn't matter because it wasn't the doctor. It was him. He wouldn't have even brought me there unless, you know, he brought me there and he left me there. It was all planned out ahead of time. A few days later, I called the Portland Police Department to follow up on the report. I was told that Officer DeLong, no longer the lead investigative officer, and I would need to speak with a different officer, can't remember who, who didn't happen to be available at the time. My recollection is that I attempted one more phone follow-up with the Portland Police Department a few days later and was told no police report had been filed. At that point, I felt the police would be no help to me, and my next best option was to be to contact an attorney. So that's when I decided, okay, you know, police aren't going to help me. I need an attorney. I still didn't have it figured out that the police were doing it. It's like, it was so far out of my realm of understanding of what police would do. For the record, in the months following this incident, I continued to be concerned about surveillance, and I attempted two more follow-ups with the police department, this time via written letters. I did not receive a response to either one of those letters. Uh, I also attempted to contact Mary, Mayor Charlie Hales about the incident, at least once via email and once in writing. I chose to contact the mayor because, according to the City of Portland website, he is in charge of the Portland Police Department. In at least one letter, one of the letters to Mayor Hales, I named specific individuals who I thought were culpable. At least twice I requested the mayor meet with me personally to discuss the problem, which I considered and still considered to be serious. I received no response from Mayor Hales, and I swear or affirm that this is correct. I still swear and affirm that this is correct. This was dated the 5th of November, 2015, and I had it notarized on the 5th of November, 2015.